All right, so find the volume of the region below that surface that lies above the region in the xy plane bounded by y equals x squared and y equals 8 minus x squared. Let me show you a couple of graphs here. All right, so a couple of things I just wanted to point out here. First of all, it's just so hard sometimes to envision what we're doing and why. Again, here's our curve floating up in, the, in z, right? It's a function of x and y, and that gives us our z. And we're saying x, you know, x squared here and 8 minus x squared here. It's almost like, I don't want to say the word prism, but that really is almost what it's like. It's like saying, okay, this is the base of my shape. And instead of a, a stable height, like we learn in geometry where we find the area of the, of the base and just multiply it by the height, the height changes according to this function. Okay, so it's just all of the, if you could kind of just drop down, like almost from the edges down, it would be all the volume enclosed in that spot. Now, this is the base, and it's always a good idea to, to graph at least the base uh, to help you recognize if it's a type 1 or type 2 uh, situation. This one, if you'll notice, uh, I think it lends itself really, really cleanly to being a type 1 because we'll always just do this red function to the blue function. You know, we this is our low bound, this is our upper. Whereas if we try to do a type 2, like a dy, eh, we run into a switch here. Okay, so I think, like I said, it lends itself really, really nicely to being a type 1 where we're going to have a, a dx be kind of our, our outer integral that we do. So remember, you know, a type 1, uh, you'll notice it goes from negative 2 to 2, and it will have dx. So dy will be the first integral we do, and that's going to go from x squared to uh, 8 minus x squared. Okay, and of course it's going to be uh, 16xy uh, plus 200. All right, so that would be the setup for this. Now, to kind of just continue and maybe just reason through, um, you know, if, uh, if we're starting with dy, again, that means that we treat x as a constant. So our first piece would be uh, 8xy squared uh, plus 200y. We would evaluate that at 8 minus x squared and x squared. Um, you know, we plug that in for, for our y's. So let me do that. All right, so you can see I've done that. I plugged in the bounds. Here they are. I plugged in, plugged in. Let me, uh, let me simplify that. All right, so I actually multiplied it all out, and I combined my like terms, and here's where I end up. And now, of course, we integrate this between negative 2 and 2, dx. So we would have negative 32x to the fourth minus 400 over 3x cubed plus uh, 256x squared plus 1600x. Evaluate it to a negative 2. And if you do that, uh, I'm just going to calculate here. get this. So I wanted to just talk about uh, how sometimes it might be wise to use polar coordinates in order to uh, maybe make some of our, our integrals easier. So you can see I'm using the exact same curve, 16xy plus 200. But instead of the equations I gave you in the previous slide, the x squared and 8 minus x squared, here I said we're finding the area that is kind of enclosed by the circle that you see. Uh, a circle with, centered at the origin with a radius of 2. And I guess going back to maybe your work in Calc 2, you'd say, well, why is polar coordinates what I'd like to use here? And the answer is, if you think about this, um, the way we would have maybe written this equation in pre-calculus, like with conic sections, we'd say, okay, so centered at the origin would be x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. So I could, you know, try and do something like this, and those would be the bounds that I would be working with. Well, those are awful. Those are terrible bounds to find the antiderivative and plug in. But remember, in polars, it's simply r equals 2. It's a very easy equation, okay? So, and it, it's, of course, just, you know, 
it, it, it's a constant. And obviously, life's going to be better. And then if you can think back to your work in, in polars, you'd say, okay, well, if I'm doing this entire circle, if I'm just finding all of it, well, then I'm talking about thetas that are between 0 and 2 pi. And those are constant as well. Now, the one thing that's a little tricky with polars, you've got to remember a couple of conversion fact, facts, right? Those conversion facts that we learned. And um, we're going to have to rewrite our equations if we're going to be in polars. And, of course, that's pretty easy to do. I mean, you know, we just say, okay, well, you know, here's, uh, here's x and y. And uh, we should just be able to substitute in you know, what x and y are equal to, that, that's easy enough. There's one little wrinkle in this that we just have to remember as we use our, our polar conversion. As we think about this, I just drew a, a random polar curve here. Um, as we think about finding uh, an area inside of a little, you know, polar curve, and remember, this is just serving as the base of our, of our three-dimensional shape. But as we start to do that, we think, okay, well, you know, from here to here, that is the change in the radius. And this is an arc length, right? And how we calculate arc length is the radius times uh, the, the angle. And, of course, that's d theta. How much, you know, of the arc are we talking about? So what we end up with in our, in our area formula for our little, uh, our little box here is an approximation that is d uh, a delta r multiplied by r times delta theta. Well, of course, that's uh, that means area is equal to r times dr times d theta. So we have to take our height. Remember, this function always serves as the height of my kind of, I, I hate to say the word prism, but it, it really likens it back to what we learned in geometry. We have to take that height and multiply it by our area of our base. So we end up, you know, we say, okay, we're going to integrate. I'm going to put the double integral. We'll talk about the bounds in a second. We'd have our 16, and instead of x, we write uh, r cosine theta. Instead of y, we write r sine theta. And we write plus 200. This is our, our height. And then we have to write r dr d theta, like that. And again, it's because this is serving as the height of our kind of three-dimensional shape, and this is serving as the area of the base. And of course, the most forgotten thing is this r. Now, this looks awful. I, I, I just, you know, I want you to think that it does look like an awful integral, but please remember, we're, as we go through it, the first thing you should just do is distribute the r in. So you could have like, oh, 16 r cubed cosine theta sine theta um, plus 200 r. And then remember, one of the variables is a constant. Okay? Okay, so you can just see, uh, I took the time to just uh, uh, multiply that r in. And, uh, and now dr is going to go first. We are doing it from, uh, you know, r r equals 2, so we're doing all of the area enclosed between 0 and 2. So those are going to be our bounds for r. And then, as I said before, our bounds for um, theta will be 0 to 2 pi. Okay. And you can absolutely, uh, you know, starting with r, this should be maybe the easier one. You can say, all right, raise the power, divide, so 4 r to the fourth cosine theta sine theta. Um, plus uh, 100 r squared, evaluate this at 2 and at 0. Um, you know, so plug that in. All right, so we've got 64 um, cosine theta sine theta plus 400. Of course, we plug in 0, we get 0. Um, so now... You know, this is what we end up with, and we could integrate this uh, from 0 to 2 pi, um, you know, d theta. Now, the one thing to just kind of be aware of is at this point, it will not be uncommon. Uh, 
to kind of have to think about um, some trig identities. Uh, you know, there's, I, I guess, some of these you could maybe do some substitution. You know, this, of course, would just antiderivative would be 400 theta. Um, you could feel free to use technology to finish this off. You know, you could type this in because now it's just down to a single integral. You could use a TI-83 um, or TI-84 to do it very easily. Um, let's set up one more. All right, so we're going to find the volume that is below this surface that I gave you, 3x plus 4y squared. The lives above that. Okay, so it's above that region. And notice I just said the first two quadrants bounded by the circles, x squared plus y squared is 1 and x squared plus y squared. So this is r equals 1 and r equals 2. Sorry, that looks like an n. Okay, so essentially, if you just think it's in, only in the first two quadrants, we're almost creating like this little band here. This is our, our bottom. So my, my r values, you know, my, my integral for r are going to be 1 to 2. And my thetas are going to be 0 to pi, like that. Okay? So let me just put that we've got, don't forget that r, dr, d theta, like that. And we're going to have 3 times x plus 4 times y squared. And there's our setup for that problem. And again, you know, it, the process, I don't want this video to get too long, and the process is kind of always the same. Like I would say, okay, it's r squared sine squared. Multiply the r in, integrate with respect to r, letting the cosine theta and si sine theta serve as constants. And then at that point, again, a lot of times you might need a lot of uh, some pretty heavy trig, um, but feel free to use technology to do this outer integral. So again, this really can help us with some ugly, ugly things, um, you know, serving as our basis. Because if we'd had to do y equals plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared, and y equals plus or minus the square root of 4 minus, I mean, those are ugly bounds. Whereas here, I mean, this is almost back to our, you know, our first few days of double integrals where we just had constants, almost just a, a box. Uh, this works great. The biggest thing in this whole piece is remember that r here has to go there, and the reason is this serves as the height, and this serves as the area of our of our kind of base where we've got uh, r dr d theta. So don't forget that r. That's the most missed part.